welcome to Cornerstone Online. My name is Jen and I'm so glad you're hanging out with us today. Let's talk a little bit about what you can expect today. We have a live host on with us right now. They're here to hang out, help guide discussion, and pray with you if you'd like prayer. We want to encourage you to participate in the chat. Say hey and be an active part of this online community. Take a moment to log in and remember that you can enter a private prayer chat at any time by clicking on the request prayer button at the bottom of the screen. Today, Pastor Fred will be leading us through our series called Different. This series is focused on the book of 1 Peter and talks about following Jesus in a world that does not. But before we do that, we're going to take a moment to reflect and prepare our hearts for what God has for us today. Sovereign Lord, you are worthy of all praise. There is no one like you, O God, creator of all things. Father, we love you and we give you praise tonight. Jesus Christ, your Son, the Holy Spirit, we worship you and adore your precious name.
Just a word to say thanks for the way that you've been giving over these past uh, 18, 20 months. Thanks for your faithfulness. I want you to know that everybody involved in this message uh, cares about your giving. It's important to everybody. It's important to the work of the church because you fuel the work of the church and of our ministry partners. But it's also important to you because every time you give, you break the power of materialism in your life and, and it's a way for you to tangibly worship God. And it matters not only to you, but it also matters to God because the things that you give to are the things that your heart is drawn to. So by actively loving God, you draw closer to God and you fuel what he is doing. So thanks for your faithfulness. I wanna remind you that there are two different ways to give. You can give in person. If you're here during one of our in-person services, we have giving boxes in the foyer. But you can also give online by going to cornerstonenj.org give. Go there and you can give online. For many people, that's become a more practical way to give during these days. Either way, it's important to everybody and I thank you for participating. There are indications in our culture that people are losing it. Um, there's an article in Time Magazine a couple of weeks ago that was called, Why is Everyone So Rude? And in their research, they uncovered that lawyers are reporting ruder clients. Restaurants are reporting ruder clients. Uh, flight attendants, to whom rude clients are no novelty, are reporting mayhem. FAA fines for unruly behavior on airlines has already exceeded a million dollars this year. It goes on to say, so legion are the reports of discourtesy that some customer facing businesses have been forced to play mismanners. For example, they say, visitors to the Indiana University Health System are now greeted by a sign that reads, please take responsibility for the energy you bring into this space. Your behavior matters. In the Cleveland Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic usually uh, uses what it calls behavioral contracts when patients' behavior is continually difficult, right? So they make these special contracts when behavior is particularly difficult. Um, in 2017, they issued nine of these behavioral contracts. So far this year, they've issued 111. It's so stark that some uh, thinkers are trying to get their heads around it, and Bernard Golden, who is a psychologist who has written a book called Overcoming Destructive Anger, says, we are going through a time where physiologically people's threat systems are on heightened alert. And he goes on to say that uh, people's mental health has been debilitated by isolation, loss of resources, death of loved ones, all sorts of other things. And he says that during COVID, there's been an increase in anxiety, reported increase in depression, and increased demand for health services. I think we can say that we have seen the same thing. People, uh, there's more alcoholism, there's more substance abuse, there's more depression, there's more uh, other things. But why are people being so rude? Where does that fit into it? Well, one writer from the University of Pennsylvania who was talking about it said, you know, when you think about it, we didn't really have time to prepare for this crisis. It just was on us. And it goes on to say that, um, that just as it seemed like the dangers of the virus had passed, uh, other limitations arrived. There were staff shortages and product shortages and longer delivery times. People are thinking, okay, now we can go shopping and go out, and they find that life is not back to normal, and there's an enormous amount of frustration. And the article seems to say that this seems to be, regardless of how people feel about the virus themselves, because they say half of the people fear COVID and the other half feel fear being controlled. So what we see is all kinds of bad behavior all around us. Now remember, the sermon series that we're looking at from 1 Peter is called Different. And it's about how we are supposed to be responding to the things around us differently than the rest of the culture. Now, bad behavior is nothing new. There have always been people who behaved badly all throughout time. 
And it's always been a temptation for Christians to follow the culture into its bad behavior. And so in this passage, in 1 Peter chapter 4, we hear Peter telling the people of his day about the bad behaviors that they're seeing. And he tells them not to indulge in those bad behaviors. So we're going to read 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to listen in on what Peter says to them. And then we're going to take those principles and try to bring them um, to our day so that we can address the bad behaviors that are happening in our culture. And hopefully not just find reasons not to do this, but what is it that God wants us to do instead of indulging in the same way? So um, it starts quite fittingly with the example of Jesus. Here's 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says this, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in their body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans do, living in debauchery, in lust, in drunkenness, orgies, carousing, detestable idolatries. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. Now, some of you hear this, and, and you can say, yeah, I've been there. I remember when I was involved in all sorts of destructive and indulgent behavior, and I turned away from it, and my friends said, how come you never party with us anymore, and I got heaped abuse on? But let's back up and say, what is it that Peter is saying, <clears throat> and what does he mean? He starts with the example of Christ, and he says, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. So the first thing we have to grasp is, what attitude is he talking about? He's saying we should have the same attitude as Christ has. In fact, adopting that attitude will become a way of correctly addressing the culture around us. So what does he say? Well, Christ suffered in his body. Why? We know that Christ didn't just suffer in his body because things went poorly for him, or he made bad choices or something like that. Jesus deliberately suffered on the cross as an atonement for sin. Jesus took sin so seriously that he knew that the sins of people leave them guilty before God, that the sins of people destroy their lives and the lives of people around them. And he came to pay the penalty for sin so that we don't have to pay the penalty for sin. But he also came to break the power of sin so that sin would no longer rule over us. Sin was so serious to Jesus that he gave his life to break its power. Now it says, arm yourselves with that same attitude. And he, he says this really strange comment. He says, because whoever suffers in their body is done with sin. And he adds in verse two, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. What, what is he talking about in there? Well, he seems to be saying that Jesus suffered um, at the hands of unrighteous and um, sinful people, um, and that when we suffer physically for our faith, if somebody suffers physically for their faith, that they kind of cross a line and it has a sanctifying effect on them such that they don't struggle with indulgent sin in the same way. They've seen evil face to face, they've made a choice for Christ, and therefore it, has a, it changes the way they behave. So imagine for a minute that somebody is being told, you have to renounce Christ or we'll throw you into prison. Or you have to stop preaching those things or we'll firebomb your store. Or just somebody say, you know, you call yourself a Christian, you know, we want, we want you to stop talking like this, otherwise we'll beat you up. Or they do, right? When, and, and those kind of things happen in various parts of the world, all over the world. They've happened throughout history, but they're happening right now in other areas of the country. When people face that kind of stuff and they would rather suffer a beating rather than renounce Christ, that they would risk their store being firebombed rather than renounce Christ, the effect of that is there's so much urgency infused into their lives that they see sin for what it is, they see evil for what it is, and they don't want to have anything to do with doing what is wrong anymore. The problem is we don't live with that kind of urgency. We don't have those same kind of face-to-face -face interactions. We don't have people say, renounce Christ, otherwise, you know, we'll beat you senseless. Instead, 
sin seems to be something that's just kind of floating out there in the culture. It's another way to live. It's another way to get through the night, right? Sin doesn't confront us. It woos us. It, it, it tempts us. And so we don't live with that same urgency. And that seems to be what Peter is saying. He says, you have to adopt that same kind of urgency. Look what he says. And this is where he lists the sins that he sees in the culture. He says, you spent enough time in the past doing what pagans do. Just listen to the urgency in Peter's voice when he says, he says, look, you've already spent enough time living the way pagans do. And then he says, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatries. And then he says, you know, because you don't do that anymore, you get abuse from people. Now, here's what Peter is talking about. Most likely, um, when he names these sins, debauchery is it's excess to the point of shamelessness. It's, it's personal indulgence to the point of shamelessness. That's what it means to be debauched, that you have no more shame. Lust, obviously, is sexual attraction removed from love and self-serving. Right? Drunkenness, excess, orgies and carousing. He's probably pointing directly to festivals that took place in pagan temples in his day. People would be worshiping pagan gods like the god Bacchus. Bacchus was a god of, of wine and drunkenness. So when they indulged in festivals for this god, there would be all kinds of drunkenness and indulgence and licentiousness, and it would just get really out of control. And sometimes they would leave the temple and march down through the middle of the city. And you could look at it and say, look at those people, they're carousing in broad daylight, he would say. Um, and so that was, that was what people did on festival days in the pagan world. And now these people have become followers of Jesus, and they don't do that anymore. They don't they don't partake in those worship festivals and they don't partake in that destructive and indulgent kind of behavior. And, um, and so that's why they get abuse because they're actually being said like, what's wrong with you? How come you don't celebrate the holidays with the rest of us? How come you don't do this kind of stuff anymore? And they have to put up with that. But Peter says, but you've got to be willing to do what Christ is. Realize that is sin and sin is not nothing. Sin is destructive, it hurts people. And so in that same way, I think what Peter is trying to get us to see is the urgency of our situation. So we look at a culture and we say, people in our culture are losing it. They're losing their minds. It seems that, like when you look at it, people are either, you know, they're either annoyed or addicted. That's probably an overstatement. But they're either upset or they keep themselves distracted so much they don't face what's going on and they don't have to be upset anymore. And we're trying to find a different way we're trying not just to distract ourselves and indulge ourselves and, and uh, kind of like drug ourselves um, or to respond with just this kind of petulant anger that just spews out on anybody who can't fight back, you know, like waiters and waitresses and stewardesses. We, it, there must be a different way. So when you think about it, our people are living in this kind of indulgent world. I remember my surprise one time when I was talking to a friend of mine who mentioned that he had been sober for five months, something like that. Um, and he was overcoming an addiction, and he says, I've been sober for five months. And I thought the term was so interesting because his addiction was not a substance addiction, not something that got him inebriated. It wasn't alcohol or pot or drugs or something like that. Those kind of things, when you indulge in them, they alter your brain, right? And so you are actually drunk or high or stoned or something like that. And so you know what sobriety is. Sobriety is when the drug is out of your system and you're thinking correctly again. But he used sobriety to say, I'm no longer being controlled by my addiction. When you think of sobriety that way, it, it, it vastly opens up the amount of addictive behavior that people are indulged in. In our culture, you know, if you, if you engage in a, um, in a destructive, illegal substance, chances are your life's going to get out of control, you're going to end up in rehab. But there are all sorts of other things that you can be addicted to in our culture that people turn to simply to dull the pain of normal life. 
Uh, you can be addicted to work. You can be addicted to noise. You can be addicted to social media. You can be addicted to gambling. And if you're addicted to gambling, not only is the culture not going to help you, but everywhere you turn, they're going to be offering you other opportunities to gamble. And they don't care if your life gets out of control. That's what's, it's just anything to dull the pain and to take you out of normal life. So I've been thinking about this, actually. I've been thinking about the different ways that drugs have manifest themselves in our society. And I was thinking, you know, the, the baby boomers, the 60s and the 70s generation, drugs was just the thing. It was the mind-altering things. It meant to expand your mind, to deepen your creativity, you know. Drugs was a good thing. It was meant to be the thing that you did that kind of brought you to a new consciousness, you know. And then people started to die. And famous people started to die from overdoses, and they realized, we, we've got to stop this kind of stuff, you know. But then the generation after them, that's known as the X generation, I think they took drugs because they just wanted to feel something. They were being faced with a world that had become so banal, so commercial, so mass-marketed, that they just wanted to live something that was authentic and real. And drugs were a way of saying, like, I want to feel something. But I think nowadays people take drugs because they're trying not to feel. You know, our young people are so wrapped up, they're so anxious, they have so much performance anxiety, so much pressure on them, it's so relentless that they go to a party and someone hands them a joint and they take it and they get high. And for once they don't feel out of, they don't feel that stress anymore. And then it becomes addicting because they're not feeling the stress. And I think our people, all the people around us are drugging themselves with social media and with substances and with food and with noise and with busyness so that they don't have to feel what's going on in our culture. So the question is, you know, what's the alternative for the follower of Jesus? Why wouldn't we just follow them down that road, right? But Peter says, first, you have to understand the urgency that sin is not nothing. Sin is why Jesus died. And we have to trust him enough to try to eliminate it from our lives. But remember, Peter's whole thing has been not only just that we eliminate sin, but that we replace it with positive good. And so in verse 7, he begins to talk about the alternative for us. And look what he says in verse 7. He says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. We'll talk about living urgently. Peter says, the end of all things is near. Now, Peter, having seen Jesus raised from the dead and having seen Jesus ascend to heaven, he probably fully expected that Jesus would return in his lifetime. And, that, and, and he felt that very acutely. Look, the end could be at any time. But you need to realize that every Christian generation has lived with this reality. We're not living in normal times. We're living in a time where someone has been raised from the dead. And now through Jesus, he is offering to people new life, forgiveness, a chance to start again, have a relationship with God. The kingdom of God is growing. This is not normal. We are living in a time where God is offering people the gift of forgiveness and entrance into the kingdom of God. The end of all things is near. The old world is, point, is, is passing away. Therefore, why would you want to indulge in the practices of the old world? He says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober so that you can pray. And above all, love each other. Now, when you think of the, the wider version of the term of sobriety, that it's not just that you're drunk, but that you could be addicted to something else, that term, be sober-minded so that you can pray, really takes relevance. Because for some of you, it's not just that you're too drunk to pray, right? In, front of, in fact, some of you are probably saying, I've said quite a number of prayers drunk. That's not my problem. But you know, if you're addicted to social media, you don't pray. You don't have time to pray. You can't concentrate to pray. If you're addicted to noise, you don't pray. If you're addicted to shopping, you don't pray. If you spend 10 hours a day playing fantasy football or playing video games, you probably aren't going to pray. You can't even concentrate long enough to pray. You don't even know what to pray about. You sit alone before God and you either fall asleep or you reach for your phone because there are things to pray about, but you can't do it because you can't concentrate because you're so addicted to the deadening aspects of our culture. Peter says, call it what it is. Regain some urgency. If you can't find time to pray, then there's something going on in your life that's taking too much time. If you can't concentrate on prayer, 
then it's because you've become addicted to the noise of our culture and you've got to retrain yourself because prayer is important. People are dying. More importantly, he says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And so now he's building a positive world where he says, I want to offer you a different way to, to address the chaos of our culture. He says, try actively loving one another. He says, this great line, love covers over a multitude of sins. That's great because we've just talked about how we're all crumbling under the pressure of this culture. And we've all indulged in these kind of things that we know are wrong. We've all been sucked into it. But he says, you know, but if you actively love other people, it'll, it, it'll put a lot of things in perspective. You know, I apply this to our world and we think, yeah, in these last couple of years, we've all probably behaved unduly rudely to each other. We've probably been rude and short and um, we've probably been judgmental toward one another and self-righteous and dismissive and all those things. But if instead we were to say, you know what, I want to address this moment of cultural pressure by actively loving the people around me, then, you know, some of that old rudeness and some of the old fractures that came to the church body would start to be healed because co love covers over a multitude of sins. And then he gives us a very practical way to express love, which is to show hospitality to one another. Hospitality was a big deal for Christians in the first century. It was one of the ways that made them different. It became such a big deal that they eventually had to set up rules for it. You know, like hospitality meant offering somebody three days. After three days, you were cut free from being hospitable. You know, at that point, unless the person brought their own food, then it was four days. That's the rule that the early church had. Um, but then he says in verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And so you've got these two pictures of how to address the stress in our world, how to address the brokenness in our world, how to address the uncertainty in our world, how to address all of the, the problems that we're facing. You can become self-centered and self-indulgent and either focus on your needs so much that you start going off on the, on the people who are supposed to be serving you in our culture. Uh, or you can become just so self-indulgent that you're going to keep yourself so distracted that you don't ever think about the stress that you're feeling. Or you could acknowledge the stress. You could acknowledge the hurts. You could acknowledge the uncertainty, and it could drive you to prayer. And you could be praying, and you could be giving it to God. And then you could be actively loving the people around you. Instead of self-focused, you could be self-giving. You can use uh, the things, hospitality, and the talents, gifts that God has given you to serve others. He's saying, you have an opportunity to live differently. You can live by prayer, love, hospitality, and serving one another. That's a different way to deal with the culture. He says in here, uh, to, and just to reaffirm the urgency, verse 11, if anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. He's saying you're not just serving. You're not just speaking to one another. You're not just encouraging one another. You're speaking the very words of God. And how can you know the words of God if you haven't heard the words of God? And how can you hear the words of God if you haven't spent any time with God? And how can you hear what God is saying if you don't turn off the noise and spend some time with God? You know, it's hard to be sober. It really is. This is a time of great cultural stress and fear. It's hard to be sober. We'll do anything rather than face it. But Peter says, but there's a better thing on the other side. Because when we face it, we turn to God. And when we turn to God, we realize the urgency that he is still at work in this world and he wants to use you and me to do it. Out of gratitude for the, for the Savior who entered this sinful world and, and directly broke the power of sin with his life. Now, if Jesus died for sin, I don't want to indulge in it anymore. Instead, I want to be somebody who can pray and who can love and who can reach out with hospitality and generosity and who can serve other people so that they can see the same Jesus. That's the way that we can be different in a culture where everyone is losing it. 
You know, it's interesting. Jesus said, if you want to find your life, lose it. <laughs> lose it in him. We're living in a culture where a lot of people are losing their lives, but not into Jesus. They're losing their minds because they have nowhere to turn. We do. Jesus says, if you want to find your life, pour it out into me and I will give it back to you. That's being different. Let's pray. Father, help us to be different in the world where people are so hurting and needy and indulgent and they just don't know an alternative life. Help us to live that life so much so that people can see it and in us see you. In Jesus' name. Hey everyone, welcome back. Thanks so much for spending time with us today. We've got a couple of announcements for you before we end our time together. On November 19th through the 21st, our middle school and high school students are going on a retreat to Hume, New England in Massachusetts. This is the last week to register for this. So if you're interested, contact Jack Hine at jhine at cornerstonenj.org. We also want to give you a heads up on our Christmas tea. It will be happening this year live and we're really excited about it. Tickets go on sale November 14th and we'll let you know more about it in the coming weeks, so stay tuned. We have a lot of other things happening throughout the week here on our Cornerstone campus. And if you're curious about that, check us out on Facebook and Instagram, or you can sign up for our weekly email by going to our website and clicking on the subscribe button at the top of the page. Thanks again for hanging out with us and have a great rest of your day. Bye.